All right, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly JavaScript new yeah, pfft, and I had to screw it up right from the beginning. This is BXGS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast episode 35. Uh, hey Bakao, welcome to the stream. Add some chill music when stream is launching. That is a good idea. I will look into doing that without getting me uh, banned. Uh, hey Anko, welcome to the stream. Okay. So we got episode 35 and um, I would call this React Hook. God, what is wrong with me today? I would call this React Hooks episode because about 50% of content we got today is about React Hooks. So let us get started, I guess. The first article we got here is called The Rise of Functional Component React version 16.7 now with Hooks. And yes, you guessed it. It talks about React Hooks, well, among other things. It also talks about everything new that is coming in React 16.7, including React Memo, React Lazy, which is actually, I believe, was shipped in 16.6. Uh, it is indeed already there. And then, of course, React Hooks. Um, hey, Manio Pro, welcome to the stream. So yes, if you wanted a quick overview of new features coming in the React 16.7, then this is the article to look at. If you already know everything, then well, this you won't really find anything new or amazing in here. So, you know. Okay, next article we got is called What are React Hooks? And it is quite literally answering the question, what are React Hooks? Why do we need them? And how exactly do you use them in um, well, more or less one use case, pretty specific use case that show you how to rewrite the code from using the classes into using the React hooks and how can they simplify the code that you actually have, which is, you know, a nice introduction to hooks essentially and uh, two effects as well. So if you still uh, haven't heard about hooks and want to learn about them, do check this article out. It will guide you through a basic tutorial essentially on how you can rewrite a pretty simple class component into using hooks. Nothing um, extraordinary or, you know, in-depth look in here. So it's basically just a tutorial. Next article we got is called why React's new hooks API is a game changer. And yes, it is also about React hooks. Uh, this is one of the better articles, let's put it this way, because first of all, they actually did a thing, the author did a thing that uh, React team was asking for and put a huge warning in the beginning that says, warning hooks are experimental, do not use them in the production yet, right? So this is the whole idea. And um, yeah, the article more or less talks about um, the advantages of hooks and not just, hey, we, we can now stop writing classes, but rather than, hey, you can actually use hooks to share behavior between components and, you know, instead of relying on old mix-ins and magic that was quite hard to reason about, you can now use hooks that are, provide better means to do that, right? So you can do the same with higher order components. So here the author talks about, hey, there's actually higher order components that more or less allow you to do the same thing, but uh, higher order components have their own problems, right? While hooks, on the other hand, don't have like, for example, they don't produce this pyramid of doom, which you get with higher order components and render props, for example, and uh, it's just a cleaner, nicer API. So then again, this is sort of, a, I guess, a tutorial on how to rewrite the higher order component with hooks, uh, sorry, with render props into using a very simple hook. So um, if that sounds interesting, if you have a lot of higher order components and you are confused about using the, or you're not confused, that's a wrong word. And you are a bit annoyed by the pyramid of doom that you get while using them. And check this article out. It might uh, convince you to try out hooks, even though, you know, you still shouldn't push them to production. They are quite nice option for uh, doing things like this. All right, next article we got is making sense of React hooks. As I said, half of the podcast is literally about hooks. So brace yourselves. Um, this article is from Dan Abramov, the uh, one of the guys, the co-author of Redux and, you know, one uh, working in the React team right now. And it is essentially the article that covers literally everything you might want to know about hooks. Why are they coming? What exactly they are? Why do we need them? Are they better than the classes? Should you use them instead of classes? What are the examples when it like how we can use them? 
Again, it is not a very in-depth article. It's more of a sort of an introduction to hooks. So if, again, if you know everything about hooks already, if you know how they work, you won't really find anything new here. If you are still confused and if you are still looking for an explainer, then this is probably one of the best ones out there. And I mean, you know, it was written by one of the guys in the React team, so that's not a big surprise. So do check this out. Next article we got is a proposal for an alternative design for hooks. And yes, people already started pretty heavily discussing, um, you know, how hooks can be done better. Are they actually good? Is there anywhere else to improve that? And this is one of the pretty great articles actually on an alternative design for hooks. And um, essentially it suggests rewriting hooks into monads. So if you are familiar with uh, functional programming, you should immediately understand what that means. If not, then uh, this article might be a bit hard to understand because it is very uh, functional programming or, or heavy with the functional programming uh, lexicon, right? And um, you would probably easily understand what the code means, like once you look at it, because it's just, you know, chaining functions and all that kind of stuff, the very monadic way of using the hooks. But in my opinion, while you know this makes the hooks pure and everything, and they are like purely functional programming, so like pure functional programming, as I said, and they are clean and they don't have any side effects and you can compose them and everything, that does look worse than the current version of hooks because it is just harder to reason about, especially if you are not very savvy with the functional programming. At least, you know, that's, that's my like two cents on that. Nonetheless, it is really cool proposal and, um, there is this uh, syntax sugar that is apparently, I'm not even sure if it was suggested or not. There's like this monadic do style syntax. I don't know if it's just Babel plugin or if it's actually a proposal. It seems to be just a Babel plugin that actually makes it look way better. So this, if, if we would have a monadic do syntax support like this, those hooks would actually be awesome. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, if you're interested in seeing the alternative options of designing React hooks and how you can approach that in a more sort of pure functional programming way, what are sort of the benefits and trade-offs of this approach, definitely read the article. It is really cool. Someone should do a meme, brace yourselves, hooks are coming. Oh, I'm sure there's already been somewhere. I mean, maybe will be before we see the release of the next version of React because the hooks are literally everywhere right now. Okay, continuing, we got React hooks, not magic, just a race. This is actually a really cool article that talks about how does the hooks actually work? So this is not what they are, right? This article talks about how they work and why are there rules like don't call hooks inside loops, conditions or nested, only call hooks from reactive functions and stuff like this. And it actually shows you how the hooks are implemented and why those rules are important, right? And it's all with a very nice images that depict the, how the hooks works. There are basically cursors and the hooks are essentially arrays, right? So it's nothing extremely complicated, but once you figure this out, it should be way easier to understand why there are rules for hooks that are currently exist, right? And uh, yes, uh, basically if you wanna know how the hooks work under the hood, this article is quite highly recommended to have a look. It is mostly talking about the use state hook, so there is not much, I don't think it ever mentions the other hooks, but if you're curious, do check it out, it is really cool. Next article we, call, uh, the next article we got is called React Hooks Demystified, and yes, it is again about React Hooks. And uh, this is sort of a more of a short one uh, talking about, well, it's, it's basically like a small condensed tutorial, if you would, for React hooks that also gives you a very brief explanation of how exactly the use state hook is made with a very basic code, which is not as in depth as the previous article, but would probably give you enough to understand all the underlying workings of it. So um, do check it out, it is quite good. Um, nothing super fancy here. So again, you know, if you understand hooks and if you know how they work, this probably won't give you anything new. If not, then this is a good starter. All right, next article we got is finally not about hooks. It is combining view TypeScript and RxJS with URX. And uh, this is exactly what it's talking about, right? So it's a tutorial on how to use view with RxJS and the URX package. 
If you wanted to add some uh, RxJS into your view applications, ViewRx is actually really cool. I used it a couple of times and it is a, quite a joy to use actually. So it makes the uh, attaching your components to RxJS observables a breeze and is quite, quite highly recommended. So if you wanted to get into that, but didn't know how to start, then this article essentially is a pretty detailed tutorial on that. Um, it is quite big and there's a lot of code here, but it will guide you through all the process of setting up view with TypeScript, RxJS and ViewRx. So if you wanted to do that, do check it out. It is quite good. Okay, next article we got is the evolution of async JavaScript from callbacks to promises to async await. It's a pretty lengthy article that essentially walks you through all the ways that you could work with asynchronous things in JavaScript, right? Starting from the callbacks from the very old way that, you know, I mean, it's still a viable approach in some cases, uh, but I think most of libraries actually use um, promises now, right? And in some cases, observables, I guess, when you need to emit more than that value. But nonetheless, callbacks are still a viable thing and they are here. And if you don't understand them, then this article basically gives you a really in-depth look into how they work and how you can use them. Then it goes into promises saying, hey, this actually at some point people thought about, okay, we, we're gonna have promises that's gonna be better for one-time values that's gonna resolve at some point. And that are actually monads, but uh, yeah, there you go. And after promises obviously talks about the async await that came uh, for as a syntactic sugar for promises, right? And make, made it a lot easier to write asynchronous codes that is essentially, I, I mean, not write to read asynchronous code, right? Because writing is, well, I guess it's a bit easier, but the reading part is what really is amazing because you can literally await things and um, there is actually should be a sync keyword over here. Um, oh yeah, because it literally talks about there should be a sync keyword in there. Okay, but anyway, um, it is a pretty good article. Again, if you already understand callbacks, promises, and the sync await, then you won't really find anything new in here. If you are still struggling with some of those concepts, do check it out. It is a really good introduction to pretty much all of them. Okay, next article we got is doing something with web components and is basically a very short tutorial on how to build your own web component. How does web components work? You know, shadow DOM, template tag, custom elements, all that kind of stuff, and how you can uh, use them in your HTML, which is relatively straightforward, but uh, if you never knew about web components or if you never, if you wanted to try but didn't know how to start, then do check this article out, it is, I mean, pretty fine tutorial, honestly. Okay, next article we got is React Higher Order Components. And it is it is essentially a tutorial on using higher order components in React and not just your typical higher order components, as in, you know, you wrap something in literal React component, but also using the functional higher order components, like for example, with, uh, where is the example? There you go, higher order function component, right? So when you wrap something in a function and then return another component that does something for you. Like for example, you frequently see this pattern with Redux or with a React Router, for example. And uh, I know that some people do struggle to figure out how exactly it works. Well, this article will um, explain everything you gotta know about that. So if you are curious about higher order components, or maybe you don't understand them completely, then do check this article out. It will teach you everything you need to know about them. Okay, next article we got is called Why You Should Avoid ORMs with Examples in Node.js. Uh, while I don't quite agree with the statement that you should avoid ORMs, there are some valid points in this article and uh, I definitely think it's worth a read. Another amusing thing that is worth noting, the author here uses this image from uh, Martin Fowler's ORM hate article that actually talks about the fact that Martin Fowler likes ORMs and doesn't think they are as evil as other state they are and you know should be avoided and everything. So I, I, I just thought it was quite amusing to see the image from an article that actually says ORMs are not that bad in an article that says ORMs are terrible. And, uh, while the article does list some valid points, uh, like, you know, there is, for example, enumeration of 
available layers of abstraction, like you could use the database driver directly, you could use query builder, or you could use an ORM, right? Um, then author goes into like, okay, so what's wrong with the ORMs? Well, you're learning the wrong thing. Speaking about, okay, so you, instead of ORM, you should learn the SQL, for example, or the query language of the database that you are using, right? Because there's not just SQL databases out there. And if you learn the ORM itself, it's not likely that you're going to switch to anything else. Well, here's the thing. It's like saying that you should learn JavaScript instead of learning frameworks. It is absolutely true. And I don't think any sane person would actually just learn, you know, framework without ending up somehow learning JavaScript. And there's nothing wrong with starting with learning ORM to then later on learn the underlying things. So it's, it's a bit of a weird argument, but I guess it kind of holds. Um, the author also gives an examples here of the most popular Node.js ORMs like uh, SQLize, Bookshelf, and Waterline. I think that, yeah, that's also the objection and how the syntax looks, which by the way is actually quite a good example of for picking the ORM that you might enjoy yourself. But uh, yeah, I don't think that's, it's like, yes, ORM is a thing that is aims to simplify writing SQL yourself, but mo mo most often than not, the ORM actually gives you a way to write the SQL yourself if you need to, right? So there's always this sort of access to lower layer if you, if you want it and if you need to optimize. Now, the next uh, reason is the complex ORM calls can be inefficient, says the author, and then presents us with a handwritten query that is like, uh, if you didn't know, the Postgres has this command explain, which can give you the complexity or the cost of operation of a specific query that you give it. So the handwritten query from author takes is, has the cost of operation of 34.12. And then he goes like, so here's the query builder, which is 34.12 as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's essentially the same query, but written in a Knex format. And then there's the ORM, which obviously would be more complex because it has to manage the models for you and everything. And the cost is 40 to 32, right? It's not marginally like higher in my opinion. So it's like, yeah, there is some overhead obviously because you're using ORM, but um, the way that ORM simplifies the queries for you, I don't, like it might be worth this complexity, you know, it might be worth this tiny overhead. And then there, we have the third reason, ORM can do everything, which is like, um, I mean, yes, it's not the point of ORM to do everything. Yes, the point is to simplify the data management layer and to provide you basic tools. It's like saying that some framework, like, I don't know, Express can do anything or can do everything, sorry, or Angular can do everything. It's like, yeah, that's not the point. Like there's always going to be things that the frameworks or libraries or tools cannot do, right? Um, then author talks about that the sweet spot is actually query builders, which I mean, I guess, you know, for some cases that works, but sometimes you actually want ORMs. So um, do read the article. There are some good thoughts about ORMs and databases, but take it with a, just a tiny bit of salt, right? Because there is some points that I don't find convincing personally. All right, next article we got here is blockchain using Node.js and Socket.io. And this is a pretty good tutorial actually on writing your own blockchain. So not cryptocurrency, not any of that crap, but the actual blockchain. So uh, as in, you know, you write the thing that has blocks, that has a chain, that has nodes, and that has the proof of work, and that has the verification of the whole chain integrity, which is the most important part of the blockchain essentially. And the most interesting idea of the original Bitcoin paper. If you never read it, uh, if you never read it, do read it because it is quite fascinating. There is a lot of mathematics in there, but the paper itself is not too big. So, you know, if you have time, I would spend uh, it definitely at least looking at it. Maybe you won't understand everything, but it is a fascinating thing. And if you, Try to create your own blockchain, which is not extremely hard. I mean, if you look at the article, it's maybe, I don't know, 20 pages a year. And the code, there's not that much code, but it basically implements the very basic blockchain and even provides a server which can, you know, allows you to access that blockchain, which is not necessary actually, but, you know, a nice addition. 
So if you ever wondered how this blockchain works and how do you build your own, then do check this article out. It will guide you through just about all the steps, including transactions, blocks, proof of work, and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool. I mean, if, you know, if you never try to try to build it yourself and you will you will see why some people are extremely excited about blockchain, but then maybe you will also figure out why the cryptocurrency is not quite might not be quite working out as much as as it as some people hope let's put it this way okay next thing we got here is effective health checks for node.js which talks about uh setting up docker health checks for node.js services so if you didn't know docker file allows you to specify the health check interface as in uh you use the health check command in your docker file and this command will be executed every, I don't remember exactly the interval, which will validate um, if, if your service, if the container is actually healthy, right? So this is very helpful for the web services, for example, where you can easily validate the availability of a service. And then you can say to Docker that, you know, unhealthy containers, for example, should be either reported or restarted, or there should be some other things happening. So, uh, but specifying the command is not enough. Obviously you have to specify, you have to write the command actually. So the command executed is typically some shell script file, or in this case, the author creates the JavaScript file that just queries the uh, MongoDB and checks the, uh, I think, well, what else? There was like the service bus. So it yeah, validates the connection to the bus which does sounds a bit weird for the health check inside of, um, I guess, what would be microservice, but you know, as an example, that would, that's okay, basically. So if you were interested in how you could do health checks in the Docker file uh, and uh, in your Node.js apps, do check it out. It is a pretty good introduction. Maybe not uh, check the health of the other services, but rather your own, which, you know, makes more sense, but um, there you go. Okay. Um, yes, now we are done with the article. So we're coming to the tinier, smaller uh, bits of news. And the first thing we got is another hook related thing, React hook related thing. And now there's a, there's a hook for that meme because people started writing hook, hooks for everything. And um, this one is actually really cool. So it's an RxJS operators React hook that allows you to literally use our xjs as um, yeah inside of your react component without actually subscribing to anything which actually looks freaking amazing and there is a version by mr ben lesh who is one of the rxjs maintainers that it looks even uh, slicker so that is just really really cool just look at this stuff um Yes, yeah, yeah, it is like there is an operator for that in RxJS. Basically, yes, it's, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they will just include uh, who, uh, Rx, oh, sorry, React hook into RxJS core itself because this, or, you know, Rx React, I think there was a library, because this looks really cool. Like, look at this code. This is just amazing. And um, at one point I was, you know, I was writing React app about two years ago that used the RxJS quite heavily. And I've had a lot of problems because I had to manually, you know, subscribe, dispose, manage the subscriptions. And that was very annoying. And if I could just do that, oh man, that it would have been so much nicer. <laughs> this look, I mean, hooks are absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, continuing. We got uh, another hooks related thing. So um, you know that the hooks are using array destructing, right? So when you say use state, for example, you get the first and the second uh, bits of array using array destruction. And currently array destruction actually invokes the iteration protocol, which comes at a cost. But here's just think about that for a second, right? React is so widespread that the V8 team, so this is a tweet from V8 engineer, um, who's saying that um, since the pattern is now becoming more common, V8 is now optimizing to minimize that overhead. So they are going to be releasing a new version of V8 at some point that will have the array destructing that is way more efficient than what we currently have because it is now in React, which is crazy when you think about it. Just how much power React has over the uh, JavaScript engine. <laughs> this is insane and really cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, because there is overhead now for this, 
there is now a way to um, destruct hooks faster, right? So, and you can actually use the object destructing for that, which I mean, looks ugly, but actually will be way faster. And while you should not write code like this because it's not idiomatic, there is, or uh, there's probably coming a Babel plugin that would optimize this for you, which is really, really cool. Uh, so until we get that optimization in the V8 itself um, and other browsers, I guess, you can use a Babel plugin that would just convert the array destruction into object destruction and make it way faster, which is <laughs> really great. All right, next thing we got is the WebAssembly threads ready to try in Chrome 70. We already talked about the WebAssembly thread availability in Chrome 70. This is now an article from Web, Fundament Web Fundamentals team that gives you a short tutorial on how exactly you can try WebAssembly threads in the Chrome 70. You, uh, it is still, of course, behind the flag, so you have to enable it explicitly, but it seems to be really simple. And um, yeah, in, in, in C code, you can literally just, uh, it seems like, use P threads and they will work in WebAssembly, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. So I'm pretty excited about the WebAssembly future here. All right, and now we're coming to the releases section. There is not that many of them this uh, time around. I mean, we have some of them, but uh, yeah, let's just start with a storybook version 4.0, bringing you the new view layers, including Ember, Marco, Mithril, HTML, Svelte, and Riot. New build tool set, which uh, is migrated to Webpack 4 and Babel 7. So some tools are still, as you can see, migrating to the newer versions. Uh, bringing you mobile support for React Native and mobile device view, uh, also UI theming and the story parameters. Um, I personally never used uh, the storybook because you know I'm not exactly running the UI shop that has the components library here, but I've heard really good things about it. So if you are maintaining a big library of UI components, do check it out. It seems to be Pretty cool tool. And now you can also even do mobile components in there, which is kind of amazing. So um, yeah. Next thing we got is Yarn 1.12, which is now stable and brings our Yarn PNP, which is the uh, node module less installations that use the global cache and global, uh, global install modules and links, as well as Yarn Audit and two uh, factor authentication support. And there's, as usual, not much more release notes for now. So I'm guessing they're going to announce it sometime next week. But still really cool that we see the Yarn PNP. Um, wait, the, oh, okay. So there's no docs for Yarn PNP yet as well, which is a bit silly. So I guess we have to wait a bit for the docs to get, you know, catch up with the actual functionality to try it out. But uh, you know what? Installing my um, Node.js modules without actually making Node modules folder is something that I'm really looking forward to. So pretty cool. Okay, next thing we got is V8 version 7.1, bringing us more memory and performance improvements and bringing us this relative time format feature that we talked about in the last podcast, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, I'm basically really, really looking forward uh, to the 7.1 landing in the Node 11. Um, I think it should probably be in one of the future releases. So a pretty cool one. And uh, now we got two node releases, uh, node 10.13, which is the first LTS release for node 10. So it's now safe to upgrade from your node eight if you still haven't done that. And you should probably because it brings a lot of really cool optimizations and uh, you know memory improvements and so on and so forth. So definitely do upgrade your LTS installations to node 10. And then we got node 11.1, which brings uh, some minor fixes, uh, specifically this fix for timers that could cause to enter an infinite loop. And we also have a top level await in REPL now, which is also quite handy. Okay, that's it for releases. Now we are coming to the library section. And yes, the first thing we got is the awesome React Hooks uh, REPL, because of course we do. It is a collection of links to different React Hooks related things. And as you can see here, there is already like two pages of those things. So, you know, if you're interested in React Hooks to check it out, there is some really interesting things. Uh, again, there's some tutorials, videos and stuff like this, which I mean, it's kind of insane how fast it exploded. But um, yeah, there you go. Next thing we got is Pennywise. I absolutely love the name of this thing. It's a cross-platform application to open anything in a floating window. 
because they will float and you will float and everything will float and it's penny wise and it's freaking amazing and it's it's essentially an electron app that just allows you to float anything it's really simple idea but the name just you know it's it's <laughs> it's just so good um yes you know 10 out of 10 for branding <laughs> all right next thing we got is carlo the new app or i guess the environment from google chrome maps and um yeah, so this is a really, on one hand, a really exciting one, on the other hand, a really uh, weird one. So Carlo is, as the description says, web rendering surface for Node applications. What that really means is it's, um, yeah, it also says it's a helpful Node app framework, but in the reality, what that means, it's, it's like an Electron JS, but without the Chrome bundled in. So it has a Node.js and then it has a special layer of API that uh, f looks for the Google Chrome installed locally and uses it instead of bundling Chrome with it. Does Carlo reduce the package build size since it doesn't have Chrome bundle? Yes, uh, this is obviously one of the things. So the advantages of working it that way is that first of all, you get Chrome installed locally, which means you don't have to install it more, more times, right? Second of all, the local Chrome installation is going to be updated separately, which means it's like higher, like much more likely to be up to date and using the latest Chrome version than, you know, whatever you bundled with. And uh, another interesting thing is that actually you can bundle your app into one single executable using PKG, or I think it actually bundles it for you by default, which is kind of cool. So my question is basically how widespread this thing is gonna be because i absolutely love an idea of electron js that shares that all the instances of the um, apps are share installed chrome version right so that means that i can have my vs code i can have my slack i can have my discord i can have all my other apps that use node.js and electron and all of them will be uh, not even half the size, even less, right? So each one of them will be half the size because they will all share the Chrome instance. That does mean that you will have need, you will need to have Chrome installed, right? So this is sort of the downside. And if the user doesn't have Chrome installed, then, well, he's kind of screwed a bit, but it's a really cool idea. And I mean, it's not the first framework to do that, but uh, this one is essentially backed by Google. And I'm very curious to see how widespread this thing is gonna be because I absolutely love the idea that you can have your app that is instead of, you know, being like 80 megabytes is gonna be like 10, right? Because this is basically, ah, wait a second, we can check actually. So I have ExaFrame, right? So I have my tiny ExaFrame tool and I bundle my Node.js ExaFrame releases using the PKG. So this is essentially Node bundle, Node.js plus ExaFrame, 40 megabytes instead of 90. So that's, yeah, that's exactly half of the size, which is insane. The title did get me lost. Yeah, the, the docs right now are not exactly clear and it's a bit hard to figure out what the hell is going on. They also mentioned Puppeteer. So some people was like, are you taking screenshots of the Chrome and then sending them to me via like remote procedure call or something? No, that's not what happens. <laughs> the docs are definitely could use some work, but um, yeah. Um, does it share Puppeteer issues? I mean, Puppeteer is, is just a way to access Chrome protocol. It's just a library to access Chrome protocol, right? So essentially you just use Chrome remotes uh, DevTools protocol and uses Puppeteer to interact with it. Um, I'm not sure which Puppeteer issues do you mean, but unless they are doing something, I'm guessing they're just accessing very low level things using Puppeteer. So it's, it's probably very different from the way you would normally use Puppeteer, right? Because they actually render things with it. Puppeteer download feature. Um, I don't, I, I, you won't really need to download anything, right? So what they do is they invoke Chrome with a specific environment and specific um, page that you provide and then hook it up to your Node.js backend. So this is basically what happens and provide the way to interact between the Node.js and the Chrome side. I don't think the downloading feature would be a huge problem for them at least. <laughs> 
But yeah, okay, anyway, quite excited to see this project. Um, again, you know, more than welcome to see the Electron JS without Chrome bundles and that can use a shared Chrome instance. This is kind of awesome. And again, really interested to see how that would develop and how widespread would Carlo be in the end, because it is like, it, it's really hard to make people switch from one technology to another, right? So we'll see how that goes. All right, next demo we got is called GraphPack. It's a minimalistic zero config GraphQL server. And uh, yeah, it's essentially exactly what it says. It's a thing that you can just run and it will provide your GraphQL on top of um, backend that you give it with minimal config. Hey, Skyoli, welcome to the stream. Okay, um, so yeah, if you wanted to try GraphQL server but was confused by all the setup required for it, then do check this thing out. It might be uh, what you were looking for. It seems to be yeah, relatively simple and set up. And uh, I I don't I haven't tried it. Maybe I should try it. <laughs> you missed about uh, half of the podcast. <laughs> A lot of things about React hooks. <laughs> it's like I don't know, sixty percent React hooks this time around. <laughs> Basically React hooks, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, next library we got is called Handsfree JS, a library for creating head controlled hands-free user interfaces via computer vision, just like that. And it looks really cool. It also has a really um, funky logo here, but essentially it's exactly what it says. You can create um, hands-free experience, the uh, vision library that provides you eye tracking functionality inside of your pages in a couple of lines of code, which is kind of really cool. So yeah, if you wanted to do a page with uh, controlled with eyes, then now you can do it in like three lines of code basically. So just check, check it out. Seems to be really nice. It's kind of crazy that you can do this in JavaScript now, but uh, there you go. Okay, next thing we got is Chrono, a natural language date parser in JavaScript, which is also really awesome. So it's a library that allows you to parse human readable strings, I guess. Is that what you'd call it? natural language strings, right? And convert them to actual dates. Like you can say an appointment on September 12, 13, and it will say, okay, Friday, September 12, 2014 at 12 GMT minus five. So I guess this is the local time zone. And it seems to even uh, understand like ranges and stuff like this, which is kind of crazy. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It seems to be really good. Uh, I guess it only works with English. So I don't see any languages mentions here, which is something I, oh no, it actually, no, wait a second. Default English choosing, no, it does understand other locales it seems, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Okay. I didn't see the name of the previous one. I'm looking for a facial recognition package for the project. Uh, as usual, you can find all the links that are mentioned in the GitHub repository. The link should be in the channel description below. The previous name was um, handsfree.js. So do check this out. Okay. Next thing we got is React Smart Key. Pass anything as a key without re-renders. A library that allows you to throw in uh, just about anything as the key to um, react items, which can be useful for lists, for example. Yeah, but uh, I don't know, the usage seems to be quite limited, at least in my understanding. Maybe you were looking for something like this. Uh, maybe you're too lazy to assign IDs to your items. So check this out. Maybe, maybe this is what you were looking for. I don't know. Okay, next thing we got is Playroom, design with code powered by your own component library. Uh, this seems to be very similar to Storybook, actually, but unfortunately, uh, they don't have any sort of a demo. So I seen some screenshots and uh, GIFs on Twitter that were showing it off. And again, it looked very similar to um, Storybook, which, you know, basically you have like sort of real time components in different sizes and screens and environments. But uh, there's no demo, so I can't really show it off to you, unfortunately. But if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is open source and uh, in very early in development. But maybe this is what you're looking for if you're developing web components, uh, UI components. So yeah. Okay. Next thing we got is Clean Logs, a better console log for browser. This is a browser-only library that allows you to render 
uh, logs in the browser in a nicer, slimmer way, I guess. As you can see here, it transforms the default object output into a way prettier output, I guess. It might be useful in some cases, but I don't know. I think I'm maybe too used to default formatting. Plus, I don't know how, like, because the default log output is not just, like, it might not be super pretty, but it's actually functional, right? And if you right click, for example, this function, you will be able to go to its definition, which is freaking handful. I'm not sure if this library provides that. And if it does, it's gonna be amazing. If not, well, then it's just a pretty print for objects, which also might be helpful in some cases. Okay. Um, yeah, it may obfuscate something exactly. This is my uh, sort of fear, but I don't know. It's like, you have to try it out and see. Okay, anyway, uh, next thing we got is called Haunted and it React Hooks API implemented for web components. We got more hooks, yes. I don't think they're coming away anytime soon. And we're probably gonna be talking about React Hooks until end of the year or maybe until they are released and then people finally start using them and start writing about them all the time. But um, this is React Hooks-like thing for web components. So you can actually use that with your native web components and with your native custom elements, which is actually looks really awesome, to be honest. This this is like, uh, because if you ever tried writing um, custom components, it is a bit of a pain in ass to manage all sort of the state and stuff like this, because they don't really have any API for that, right? So you have to invent something yourself. This basically fixes it, so you can just uh, use hooks, which which is great. This just, <laughs> just looks amazing. So yes, if you're writing custom components, web components, do check it out. You might just replace half of your state management with this, which looks absolutely awesome. It also has all the other hooks like use reducer and memo and I don't know if it has effects, probably it does, right? Yes, it does. Okay, so it has literally all the React hooks there. So there you go. <laughs> okay, next thing we got is Classico, a tiny 255 bytes shim when element class list cannot be used. Exactly what it says, class list shim for older browsers. If you're working with something very old and need to use class list or want to use class list because it's just uh, convenient, uh, you can just use the shim. It is quite nice and very tiny. Right, next thing we got is Howler.js audio library for modern web. Uh, basically allows you to do just about anything you want with audio in the browser, including audio sprites, sp spatial audio, codec supports for basically whatever the hell you can imagine, including Flax, which is kind of impressive, to be honest. Works everywhere and um, yeah, it's it's crazy what you can do. It, it seems like you can even use it in the games. Yeah, so spatial audio works quite well. So yes, if you were looking for an audio library uh, for the web, do check out Howler.js. It apparently is used by just about every large company you can imagine, including Mozilla, Disney, Google, Ubisoft, Paramount, Warner Brothers, even NASA, like NASA, like is it NASA or NASA? I guess it's NASA, right? So um, yeah, there you go. Okay, next thing we got is uh, RV, I guess RV is how you call it. It's the charts for terminal. And um, yeah, it's exactly what it says. You can do different types of charts in your terminal either using uh, basic symbols or using a C art and it looks pretty fancy. So, you know, if you ever need to output something in the dashboard, that looks really neat. Wanted to do a player with it. We'll try it with Carlo. Yeah, that should work quite well. Um, all right. Next thing we got is Glorious Demo. The easiest way to demonstrate your code in action. This is literally a thing that allows you to write fake demos basically. <laughs> where you can uh, code a thing that, you know, opens editor, writes code, opens terminal, executes your code, and then you fake response and command. So if you wanted to quickly, and I guess then you execute it and get a GIF like this, uh, at least this was my initial understanding of that. Uh, it's pretty neat, but um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's the probably the fastest way to make a demo like this because otherwise you would have to write it yourself or record the screen yourself, which, can be a bit annoying. <laughs> so yeah, pretty neat little library here. Um, okay, 
Next thing we got is a Slonic, a Postgres client with strict types. Uh, let me try that again. Postgres client with strict types, detailed login and assertions. Um, it's just another Postgres client, but has the strict types as a test, detailed logging and assertions. And uh, I cannot really say much more about it because I haven't really used it. I prefer the official PG one, which works just fine. But uh, you know, maybe you were looking for something like this. So check it out. Next thing we got is Huntspell Asm, uh, WebAssembly based JavaScript bindings for Huntspell spell checker. So essentially somebody took Huntspell spell checker. If you never heard about it, it's a pretty popular uh, spell checking library written in C++ and compiled it to WebAssembly. So you can, you can now use it in JavaScript. There you go. Yes. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, before we had this saying, if it if it can be written in JavaScript, it will be written in JavaScript. Now we have this, if it's written in C++, it will be compli compiled to WebAssembly. I think it's going to be true, like if it's written in something else, it's going to be compiled into WebAssembly at some point, <laughs> once we get the threads and everything else to support it. But um, yeah, there you go. So if you wanted a really fast C++ checker in your JavaScript uh, spell checker, then check this out. This seems to be pretty nice. Okay. Next thing we got is Easy React Form, a simple way to work with forms in React. Forms library for React, not much to say here, seems to be pretty straightforward, seems to also be built around uh, Bootstrap primarily. So um, yeah, that's awesome, I'm good with JavaScript. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good time to be a JavaScript developer right now. <laughs> Okay, um, next thing we got is nano styled, a less than one kilobyte library for styling React components as if CSS and JS, but without CSS and JS. So it sort of promises to provide you low overhead of CSS and flexibility of component based APIs of CSS and JS, which sounds kind of amazing. And looks like this. So if you if you like this kind of styling, do check it out. I mean, it looks okay, but I don't know. I personally just usually use CSS. I guess, I mean, I guess if you work with components, then this might be more preferable, but um, I guess luckily for me, I don't really need to write that many components that I publish. So I'm okay with just CSS. But you know, maybe you have a use case like this, check it out. I mean, again, less than one kilobyte is kind of amazing. But yeah. All right, next thing we got, and this is the last in the libraries and demos section is called rendxp.js and is actually quite fascinating. It can create random strings that match a given regular expression. So it's the reverse regular expression library to which you provide a regular expression and it generates a string for you that will fit that expression, which is, I don't even want to know how that works because that sounds insane. <laughs> and really awesome at the same time. So yes, um, I guess could be very useful for testing stuff, for example. And uh, I cannot think of any more use cases, to be honest, but it is impressive nonetheless. Uh, generating seeds, that's actually a good idea as well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is also a pretty good use case for it. But anyway, check it out. This seems to be quite cool. And um, again, pretty fascinating, but should probably read how it was built at some point because that sounds really cool. All right, that's it for the libraries and demos. Now we have some interesting articles to close this off. Article number one is called Google Chrome one year in, and it's actually um, a retrospective from a guy who started working in Google on uh, Google Chrome team. And um, this is what happened in a year of work over there and how it looked and what kind of things he did and what kind of environment is there. And if you ever was interested, how does the team that works on Google Chrome functions, then this is a really interesting insight into it. So, you know, do check it out. The last thing we got is this October 21 post incident analysis from GitHub blog. Uh, if you, you probably heard about it. So on October 21, GitHub was down for, well, almost 24 hours, I think. And um, this basically explains what happened. This explains what they did, how they fixed it, why, what was the problem, what exactly went wrong and why it took so long to fix everything. So if you're interested in DevOps and infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, do check this out. It is quite fascinating. Um, I think it is. <laughs> All right, 
this is it from my side. So this is all the things that I have for uh, this week. So if you guys have any questions, any links that I might have missed or any suggestions or any of your projects to share, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can wrap it up here for today. As usual, feel free to um, join our Discord channel if you have any questions or need help with JavaScript. If not, then uh, there's also my Twitter where I post things. It is wherever down below. <clears throat> and um, yeah, that's basically it for my side. So I will give you a couple of minutes to think about questions you might have. Um, if not, then thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you're watching VOD for this, um, or you know, if you haven't seen the whole thing, there is a VOD on YouTube. You can watch that there. Um, Skyoli, there is VOD after that on Twitch and on YouTube as well. So you can watch the whole thing if you missed it. As I said, um, there it happens weekly on Saturdays, always on the same time. So feel free to subscribe and come again. More than happy to see more people in chat and uh, talk about JavaScript news. Uh, all right, cool. Doesn't seem like there is any questions or any things you guys want to talk about. So let us go and enjoy our weekends. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for staying with me. As usual, all the links are on the GitHub as already mentioned. Join our Discord server, subscribe to me on YouTube if you wanna see VODs, uh, follow me on Twitter if you want announcements before the streams. Have an awesome weekend and I see you next time. Bye.